So this was the place the old man lived, tumble down town, lost in the mountains and lost in time. So this is where it began. My great grandfather came up here to get rich back in 1864. And he did get rich, not gold. Oh, he found some in the cricks and the pits he dug. But what he really discovered was the land. This strange, beautiful, powerful province of earth and sky called Montana. So I've come back to where the old man dreamed and dug and died. My heart beats his blood. It looks like I've come full circle. Maybe I can bend that circle straight and make a road I can travel by. And I won't be lost anymore in the mountains or in time. I followed the ghost of the old man west, along the Missouri, through country carelessly carved, as if by a sculptor gone mad with solitude. Family legend claims he arrived on the boisterous wings of steam, one of the first fire canoes that came coughing and thundering through these silences. Most of those old potential disasters wrecked on white water rocks or blew up like fire bombs. But he passed by here, the old man, in the steamer of Captain Joseph Labarge. From the mouth of the Yellowstone to Fort Benton, it took 30 cords of cottonwood a day to feed the boilers. Even then, technology was changing the land. As I followed the past westward through Montana, I wondered what the old man must have seen and felt about this vast, wild place. He left no journal, unlike Lewis and Clark, who came upriver less than 60 years before. Maybe he saw the grizzly, that furious and formidable white bear of Lewis's journal. The Missouri country must have been a huge natural panorama abounding with life. Lewis wrote that wildlife was so plentiful, he and Clark could send out at any time and obtain whatever species of meat the country affords in as large a quantity as we wish. Those were his words. He said it would be impossible to name or estimate the number of all the wild animals along the river. The buffalo were so many that they barred the explorers' progress along some reaches of the Missouri, and they had to club them out of the way. How strange that in those days the animals seemed unafraid of man. They would learn in time. My great-grandfather would have seen the enormous herds of buffalo. He could not have known that nearly all of these great brooding beasts would be gone within 20 years. What a magic, abundant, pristine, natural world he must have seen, that old man on his way west to the gold camps.
This country has always been a magnet for wandering spirits. People never seem to stay in one place too long. The Indians, Flathead, Crow, Blackfeet, Nez Perce. The explorers, mountain men, miners, surveyors, preachers and priests. Most came, passed through, then passed on. Trappers pursued the beaver. Woodhawks cut the river cottonwoods down. Miners dug holes in the earth. Surveyors drove their stakes along the crest of the bitter roots. Settlers cleared the woodland, fenced and plowed the eastern prairies. Hillsides were stripped of timber to supply wood for sawmills and smelters. But still, in my great-grandfather's time, people had a kind of innocence about the land and the wild things around them. After all, nature was enormously abundant. They took what they wanted and left. And when they left, they left the land changed. The old man met a woman who came up the river. My heart beats her blood. They had a son, whose son would be my father. I remember my grandfather with a kind of sorrowful clarity. He told me about the changes that came to the country and wildlife when he was growing up, and how things began to go terribly wrong. He remembered when the railroad came through in 1881. The gold had played out. Father and son took a job with the Great Northern, once laid eight miles of track in a single day, all by hand, no machines. He told me how towns sprang up along the rivers and the rail. The wanderers of those days decided to stay in this big, open country. People came pouring in. There was plenty of Montana territory to go around. They built sawmills even deep in the Sun River country. Lodgepole and fur fell to the blade and to the growing need for railroad ties. Long before, Texans had driven the first herds of Longhorns up this way and stayed. The Homestead Act was passed and the prairie felt the cut of the plow. There were lots of ways to make a decent dollar in those days. There was a thriving market in hides and Lord knows there were plenty of animals to skin. You could get $75 for a pair of elk ivories. My grandfather knew Buffalo Bill Cody, told me how Cody had a contract to supply meat for the railroad, killed more than 4,000 buffalo in 18 months. He'd go after the fattest cows and heifers, take the hides and tongues, and leave the rest to rot. Once on a wager, he killed 69 in a single day. By 1876, 80,000 buffalo robes a year were being shipped down the Missouri. My grandfather remembered the year because it was the year Custer died at Little Bighorn. The year before, Chief Joseph stood in the Bear Paw Mountains and said he would fight no more. Montana was forever changed. Nature's wounds were deep. The earth was bleeding and had little more to give. My grandfather told of those years with a sense of surprise. 
as if the alteration of the environment and the disappearance of the wild lands and wild life was due to some kind of cosmic sorcery. People looked around one day and they felt a certain ghostly stillness. Where were the wintering deer? Where were the moose, the grizzly, the bighorn sheep, the antelope and the bison? Where were the elk? He told me about the time when he began to realize what he had done, that he had been a part of something terrible. He listened one night for familiar sounds, and there was something wrong. He began to mourn the things he couldn't hear. All night he listened, and there was no deep, defiant challenge, echoing, bounding, from rim rock to rim rock. It's a sound that walks down the spine with chill feet, he said. But the absence of that sound was shattering. It was the night my grandfather knew the elk was gone. Its bugle, only a memory. family moved. My grandfather had a homestead now and some land freely taken. The old miner was buried beneath a weathered stone. He went to dig a well one day and died instead. Now he is a part of the earth, the limber pine, the prairie. He is no more or less than the grasslands that meet the eastern front. Now I walk the land where my family lived so long. And I feel again that mysterious connection between earth and man. You can't be in Montana long without feeling the power of this union. Everything is shaped by nature's hand. Each day, each season, is a portrait nature paints. The earth and the cloud and the scent of nature's breath are all around, enveloping, sometimes passionate, and sometimes very still. Blood and mind and spirit of my family and the leaf and the seed and the eye of the red fox are painted with the same brush. There was a time just before the century turned when this land changed my grandfather. He began to see nature differently. Before he died, he told me he had met Theodore Roosevelt once in Yellowstone country. The only man he ever knew who could read Tolstoy on horseback. He began to see the world through this strange, complex man's eyes. The old Rough Rider's manner careened from joy to outrage. He joyously experienced the wild places and wild things around him and was outraged they were vanishing. And he said something my grandfather never forgot. He said, the joy of living is his who has the heart to demand it. My father was a newspaper man, editor of a small journal with a very big voice. He had a passion my father had. He would join the fight to save what was left of Montana's wildlife. 
as Roosevelt would say, he had the heart to demand it. He fought for laws placing quotas on big game and the enforcement of laws by wardens. But as he worked to support the emerging conservation movement in Montana, he came to what seemed a logical conclusion. If hunting could be restricted, strictly controlled, wildlife numbers would increase. Yet the logic had a flaw. If certain animals were to be protected, their predators must be controlled. So in my father's mind, there were good animals and bad animals. We must kill the bad ones, he insisted in his editorials, and thereby save the good ones. The good animals, in my father's view, included the deer, the antelope, the moose, and elk. His lexicon of bad animals included the mountain lion, the bobcat, and the grizzly bear. His practical conservation philosophy was to ban hunting the good animals and have open season on the bad, even on the newly created national park lands. Like so many of his generation, his heart was in the right place, his thinking dead wrong. In many cases, this thinking actually had a negative impact on deer and elk. Historic winter ranges had been lost, yet the populations increased. Soon herds grew too large for their food supply and winter starvation resulted. When I was young, my father took me along the Great Divide up into the Bob Marshall wilderness. It was shortly after World War II. We camped along the North Fork of the Sun, and we listened to the conversation of the river. It had the sound of chimes, or a foreign language spoken fast and low. Everywhere you looked, things were held in balance. The eagle balanced beautifully on the wind. The mountain held the sky aloft, just right. All living things were held in a delicate embrace. The seasons circled each other like dancers. The bear sleeps, the trout spawns, the elk remembers the trail toward winter. It was here, in this pristine setting that my father began to understand the balance between wildlife and the environment. He saw a clear and marvelous connection between earth and life form. If we are to preserve wildlife, we must first preserve the environment. The connection is absolute. The one cannot be accomplished without the other. We took many trips in the years to come. My father's conservation ethic continued to mature. He began to develop an ecological conscience. In his editorials, he worked to change public attitude, to inspire, to persuade, to advocate for research and enlightened regulations, and for proper care of the land. He worked to create alliances of people whose views and interests differed, but whose concern was deep and real. Fishermen, hunters, farmers, ranchers, bird watchers, river runners, outfitters, naturalists, smelter workers and miners, teachers, garden clubs, senior citizens groups. It was a uniquely American movement 
a grassroots confederation of interests, both private and public. Working together, little by little, they learned from their past mistakes and hammered out ways to keep the wild world wild. To preserve a lifestyle that was anchored more in nature than in the affairs of men. My father said it was all a matter of balance. Balance, he said, is the interaction of opposing forces. There is nothing really passive in nature. There is something about this place called Montana that makes you feel absolutely alive. How can you help but feel your nerve ends sing when so many living things abound around you? Not as much as my great-grandfather knew, but more and more each year. Just as joy begets joy and sorrow, sorrow, life attracts life. Montana is not always an easy place to live, not for elk or moose or mountain lion, and not for man or woman. There are bad times, hard seasons, bitter harvests. But to live without these things, shielded from the earth by concrete and technology, is hardly to live at all. It is to be a prisoner locked away in a world that isn't real. We are animal, you and I. There are dangers in the forest and in the mountain and in the rivers. But like the bear, the elk, the antelope, the people of Montana must live free. Something happened in Montana that has happened nowhere else. People of all kinds, with all kinds of interests, looked around at their world and decided, we can conserve and create simultaneously. We can create mines and railroads and towns and ranches and a future rich with possibility. We can have all these things and still preserve the magic my great-grandfather knew when he came this way. This is the reality of the conservation movement in Montana. So I'm drawn back to this country, to the earth where the fathers of my father lay beneath cottonwood and old stone, to a way of living that is real and comfortable with the spiral glide of time. We are four generations. The roads we've walked have spanned a century and more. Yet our lives are somehow simultaneous, held inseparable by this place. We fished the same streams, followed the elk into the same mountains, felt the same wind walk the meadows. We felt that same rare exuberance of spirit only felt by those who are truly free. I came back to Montana to find where an old miner dreamed and dug and died. I looked for the past and I found instead the future. I found a road I can travel by. It is a curve as all things in nature are and it leads me full circle to where my great grandfather lived and dreamed and died and to where my great grandsons will, God willing, do the same.